Welcome to the East African portion of events. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Nanjala, and I am a traveler. For me, travel is not just an abstract experience. It's an expression of my personality. It's an expression of a desire to connect with people across time and space and geographies. I remember one time someone asked me, Nanjala, where is home for you? And I said without batting an eyelid, for me, home is where my suitcase is. Home is where I can build, where I can grow, where I can connect. And ideally, though, that is somewhere warm. <laughs> I recognize that the ability to travel the way that I do is based on a great deal of privilege. Some of the opportunities that I've had in my life, the things that I've said yes to in my life, have opened up the world for me in a way that they simply don't for people of a similar demographic and a similar background. As we speak, there are over one billion people in the world today that would be categorized as migrants. 29 million people who are refugees. Many of them are young and African, such as the people in this room. Some of those people will have to make incredibly difficult decisions about why they're leaving and where they're going. Many of them will give up everything in order to pursue a dream. Some of them will lose that everything. Many of them will die. And so I don't take the opportunity to stand here, to travel here and stand and speak to you today for granted. I see it as a responsibility, an obligation to speak for people that the world would rather forget. I've been working in and around issues of migration for about 10 years now. And one thing that stands out to me increasingly is that we've built this complex bureaucracy that is more interested in preserving and protecting the status quo than in doing something about a world that is increasingly on fire. I see us building systems that are designed to survive and to perpetuate themselves in, and to survive in perpetuity, but not to do the core work of protecting human life. More importantly, I see something that causes me every day a great deal of concern. I see money replacing values as the core reason, as the justification for why we do the things that we do, why we speak up when we do, why we stay silent at other moments, and why we try and live in the societies that we have built. Now look, don't get me wrong. I'm not so naive to believe that there was some kind of golden era where everybody was motivated by ideals and values and everybody was simply acting out of the interests of other people. Individuals, societies, communities, they all operate with a measure of rational self-interest. That's always been the case. But I'm concerned that increasingly we're not even making attempts to justify what we're doing or not doing in terms of values and ideals. We're not aspiring to be better than the dollar value that we place on people, on items, on communities. I'm concerned that increasingly money has become the metric for everything, and shockingly, including human life. And people who are found not to have met the values that we've assigned to human life to say that these people are worth protecting, those people become expendable. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the conversation about human mobility. Since 2014, over 73,000 people have tried to get into Europe through the Mediterranean Sea. At least 18,000 of those people have died. Many of them are young, many of them are African. Even as we speak right now, there are boats carrying hundreds of people suspended in legal and political limbo on the Mediterranean Sea because European countries have decided that they are the wrong kind of human. Along the southern border of the United States, there are hundreds of people being held in cages, being forcefully separated from their children under all kinds of violations of human law, because the most, of human rights law, because the most powerful country in the world has decided to criminalize asylum. 
the Australian government has entered unconscionable agreements with the countries of the South Pacific to keep people of certain demographics away from their coastline, away from their territory, driving people to suicide, to self-immolation, because they are the wrong kind of human. What does it mean to be the wrong kind of human in the modern age? A lot of it comes down to money. A lot of it comes down to how we determine the goodness, the worthiness of a person. And increasingly, states are articulating this value in terms of money, or quote unquote, the economic contributions that those people make. But the thing is, people have always moved. Mobility is as old as people. We move for various reasons that can be captured really perfectly in what po poet Wasan Shir said. We move because home becomes the mouth of a shark. Sometimes that shark is more figurative than it is literal. Sometimes the shark is we wake up and we look around at our societies and we don't see a way of living up to the potential that we know we have within us. We don't see doors opening. We don't see opportunities presenting themselves. But sometimes the shark is a government that decides that you are an enemy of the state because of your political opinion, because of the ideas that you want to share with the world. Sometimes the shark is a neighbor deciding that the community that you belong to that the people that you pledge loyalty to are no longer welcome within that territory. And you know what? Sometimes people move just because they can, and that's okay too. The inevitability of human movement, of mobility, is reflected in our cultures, in the languages that we speak, in the food that we prepare, in the music that we make. I can't tell you what it felt like the day that I discovered that one of my favorite songs from the 1980s, a Cameroonian song called Zangalewa, is still today one of the most popular songs in Colombia. <laughs> the national dish of most of East and Southern Africa, ugali, mili, pap, is made from maize flour. But maize is not indigenous to Africa. It comes to Africa through the process of global trade, through migration from South and Central America. Can you imagine what British food would look like without African and South Asian influence? Can you imagine how grim and gray that would be? <laughs> so if human mobility is an inevitable, inevitable part of our existence, what's changed? Why over the last couple of years are we seeing countries increasingly drawing up, pulling up the drawbridges and filling their moats with crocodiles? Crisis after crisis of quote unquote migration. What's changed is the borders, the lines in the sand. No longer is the border simply a line in the sand that basically separates one community from another and allows people to basically know that they belong in one place and not the other. Today, the border is a site for state power. That's where governments tell each other that they are strong. That's where governments project their power onto their own citizens and the citizens of neighboring territories. And that is why borders have increasingly become sites for some of the worst atrocities that we have seen in the modern era. That is why the governments of Europe can decide that they would rather let people die in the Mediterranean Sea than have to confront the reality of the injustices that they have fled and left behind. At the heart of all of this, is the concept of good and worthy migration. Now the problem that we have today is not even so much that borders have become hard. It's that you can find people buying their way around some of these hardenings. Ultimately, there isn't a place, a country in the world that won't take in a person for the right amount of money from the very same countries, from the very same societies that are being rounded up and are being punished simply for the crime of wanting to move. For the right price, you can buy not just a visa or an entry or an exit permit, you can buy a passport. You can change your citizenship. What we're saying is that the goodness and the worthiness of a migrant is not dependent on who they are, on what they bring in terms of culture and history, but 
fundamentally because of money. I'm speaking to you today primarily in the context of migration, but this is a thing that we're seeing playing out in all the facets, all the arenas of what I would call the international system. We see it in international organizations being coerced to not speak up, to not act on specific issues because they don't want to upset the donors. We see it when rich and powerful countries can com publicly commit atrocities against minority groups in their own communities, recorded on mobile phones, distributed around the world, and no one will do anything because they're afraid of offending the countries that have the deepest pockets. I could list multiple examples of how the decision-making around protection, around saving human life, has shifted from we, the people of the world, working towards peace and security, to we, the states, looking to protect whatever marginal economic advantage we can protect in the society that we live. In economics, we talk about the functions of money as a measure of value, as a store of value, as a means of exchange. And underlying all of that is the idea that money allows us to make objects speak to each other. And by that I mean to allow us to measure the relative weight that we place on one object against another. But increasingly, we're seeing money itself become the desired object. It's no longer accumulation for the sake of building. It's no longer accumulation for the sake of making life better for people. It is accumulation for the sake of accumulation. And where does that leave the human? Where does that leave the person? The system, it won't survive. It can't. And Open the newspaper, log onto the internet any, any day, and you will see evidence of this. All the protest, all the resistance, all the opting out, is people saying, we do not want to be quantified in this way. The system that you're building is not seeing our humanity. It is seeing us as units of labor. It is seeing us as units of production, and we are more than that. What we're trying to do in this context, where so much power and the discourse of money has done by shifting more power towards states and away from people, is we're trying to claw back a sense of humanity and more importantly, a sense of wholeness. Ultimately, values, ideals matter in life and in politics. The thing is, it's not so much that we have built a perfect system it's not so much that we can build a perfect system. It's about believing in the possibility of a perfect system and coming together to work towards that. That's what values do. They give us a sense of orientation that we are all pulling in the right direction. Where values and ideals create centripetal forces that pull us together, money creates centrifugal force forces that pull us apart. Money creates incentives for competition. Values create incentives for cooperation and collaboration. And this thing that we're doing, where we're contorting ourselves and the idea of being human to fit into a paradigm where money matters more than anything else, this is where we go wrong. And if we're not careful, this is where we will lose everything. 